The next item of business is a statement by Angela Constance on historic child abuse. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement. There should be there for no interruptions or interventions. And I call on uh, Angela Constance, Cabinet Secretary, 10 minutes. Thank you, President Officer. On the 11th of November, my predecessor, Michael Russell, stood in this chamber and spoke about the moral imperative that compels all of us to face up to and act on the reality of historical abuse of children and the current risks of child abuse. In his statement, he laid out this government's commitment to move comprehensively and quickly on these issues. And he reflected on the achievements of Survivor Scotland, the interaction process and the establishment of the National Confidential Forum. And he promised to return to this chamber to set out the government's view on whether a national inquiry into historic abuse in Scotland is the right way forward to meeting the needs of survivors. Today, presiding officer, I am making good on that promise. There have been national investigations into this issue before, such as the Shaw Review and the Care Law Inquiry. And it is important that any further inquiry complements and builds on previous work while moving this issue forward. We must also be conscious of the work already underway with survivors. The Scottish Government has already given its commitment to working to develop a survivor support fund and also to fund an appropriate commemoration guided by the views of survivors. And the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs has invited key stakeholders from the legal sector to consider how the civil justice system can be more accessible and responsive to survivors of abuse whilst children in care. And this will include consideration of the way in which the time bar operates. And we will continue to work with survivors to ensure the fullest understanding of the civil justice barriers faced by survivors today. Our dedication to considering all of the issues must match the seriousness of the issues. We have witnessed the pitfalls when an administration rushes to make decisions about an inquiry without involving the people who will most be affected by it. We are not a government that believes in haste at the expense of sense. And we are committed to delivering on what we promise. And the victims of abuse are owed nothing less than a thorough consideration of all factors before a decision is reached. Presiding officer, of course the case for an inquiry is strong. And I am sure that I do not need to tell members of this chamber that we owe it to survivors to find the truth, to speak that truth wherever it needs to be heard and to listen and learn from what we hear. But we must also be mindful that inquiries are major undertakings. The decision to launch them cannot be taken lightly and the planning around them must be careful and inclusive with a clear focus and not open-ended in either remit or timescale. And as part of the Scottish Human Rights Interaction Response, I have met with a number of survivors on Monday along with the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs and the Minister for Children and Young People, and we discussed what an inquiry would mean to them. And I have deliberated carefully, having listened to their personal experiences and concerns. I have also reflected on the words of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who once said that if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Presiding officer, this parliament must always be on the side of victims of abuse. We must have the truth of what happened to them and how those organisations and individuals into whose care the children were entrusted failed them so catastrophically. And we will get to that truth and we will be establishing a national public inquiry into historical abuse of children in institutional care. And to ensure justice is done, I can tell this chamber that where crimes are exposed, the full force of the law will be available to bring the perpetrators to account. And I can advise the chamber that the Lord Advocate has been consulted on holding the inquiry and measures will be put in place to ensure that the inquiry does not compromise or interfere with ongoing criminal investigations and prosecutions. And I am grateful to the survivors of institutional child abuse who have taken the time to meet with me and other ministers 
and who have spoken so bravely and eloquently about why they consider a public inquiry is needed and why it is necessary. Of course, as vital as their voices have been in getting us to the point, and indeed these voices have been vital, I am also acutely conscious that there are many more survivors who remain silent. As abused children, they had no voice, no one to cry out on their behalf at the appalling injustices they suffered while growing up. And today, they await the right circumstances for their experiences to be heard. And I sincerely hope, presiding officer, that the public inquiry will provide such an opportunity. Because as a society, we have an opportunity to confront the mistakes of our past and to learn from them. It will not be easy, but only by shining a light on the darkest recesses of our recent history will we fully understand the failures of our past, enabling us to prevent them happening again and to ensure a brighter future for every child and young person in Scotland, eh, both today and for tomorrow. Presiding officer, a few weeks ago, the First Minister set out the priorities for our government, speaking about the need to build a fairer and more equitable Scotland. It is a vision of a Scotland that will look truth square in the eye, and one that will not be quick to judge, but one that will not flinch from what is discovered. For that reason, the inquiry will be a statutory inquiry under the Inquiry Scotland Act 2005. It will have the power to compel witnesses to attend and give evidence if required. As intimated earlier, we will consult with survivors and relevant organisations on the exact terms of reference, and I propose that this process be complete by the end of April. Those terms of reference need to capture the principles of the inquiry and how we can create the right environment to support victims to confide and the right timescales time scales over which it should be held. That process must also find the right people to oversee the inquiry, not least any chair or panel. We will not make the same mistakes as others by rushing out with names before we have consulted with survivors and relevant organisations about the attributes of a chair or panel. To support this work, I have asked the Centre for Excellence for Looked After Children in Scotland, Celsus, to provide ongoing logistical support, academic input and expert advice throughout the process. Indeed, engagement with survivors has already started in earnest. Scottish Government officials have written to survivor organisations on plans for engagement around these matters for the first few months of next year. We have had a positive response from organisations who have welcomed the opportunity to speak to us in a setting where survivors will feel comfortable in having their voices heard. As part of this, we will also hold a series of regional events which will give a wide range of stakeholders the opportunity to contribute. And as well as shaping the Survivor Support Fund, these events will be used to consult on the inquiry uh, with a view to having the terms of reference and announcing a chair or panel, as I said earlier, by the end of April next year. Presiding officer, I want to conclude my statement with one further reflection. When this parliament was reconvened in 1999 and Scotland's inaugural First Minister Donald Dewar addressed the nation during the opening ceremony, he spoke of the four words on the mace that sits in this chamber, wisdom, justice, compassion, integrity. And those are the words that resound whenever this chamber has turned to this issue. And they are the words in which this inquiry will be founded. Thank you, presiding officer, and I'm happy to take questions from members. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, but um, I will let it run on as long as necessary, after which we'll move to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question were to press the request speak button now, and I call Ian Gray. <clears throat> thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, thank you to the Cabinet Secretary for her statement and early sight uh, of it. It is a welcome statement uh, and a welcome decision. In truth, it, it should have happened sooner. I understand the points the Cabinet Secretary made about uh, the care and the lack of haste required 
in coming to a view. But it is 10 years since the former First Minister, Jack McConnell, apologised on behalf of the Scottish people to the survivors of institutional child abuse. For a moral imperative, this has proceeded and progressed too slowly. This next step has taken too long, but we are taking it today. The most important thing, and the Cabinet Secretary acknowledged this, and she was right, is that those survivors who have campaigned long and hard, and those who have always felt unable to speak out, all have faith in the process we begin today. To that end, can the Cabinet Secretary give us some indication of how widely and which institutions she expects the inquiry to investigate? Can she elaborate on how she will consult survivors on the appointment of a chair inclusively and transparently to avoid the missteps we've seen elsewhere? Can she tell us how will survivors be supported through expenses and otherwise in giving their evidence? And how will she ensure that this inquiry does not just examine the historic abuses, but ensures that these shameful events are not and cannot occur in Scotland today? Cabinet Secretary. Sign officer, I'm grateful to Mr Gray for the, the tone and tenor um, of his question. Um, he does, of course, make the point um, about why we are having an inquiry now. And indeed, I'm very acutely conscious uh, that it is 10 years ago since Jack McConnell uh, made that very public apology uh, on behalf uh, of the nation. It is, however, important to recognise uh, that much has happened uh, in the last 10 years. There's been the, the national strategy um, which was introduced in 2005 by the previous administration, and this administration took that forward. Uh, since 2007, we have seen uh, the Shaw Review uh, and the Care Law Inquiry. Um, we currently fund 25 organisations which support uh, survivors. Uh, and as ministers, we are actively participating in the Scottish human rights interaction process, which in August this year produced um, a new paper and I think made a very compelling case um, about why we now need uh, that inquiry. It is important that as we move forward um, over the first few months uh, of 2015 that we move forward hand in glove with survivors and organisations uh, that repre represent them and they do indeed need to be consulted about the, the person spec and the skills that we require um, either in terms of the chairperson or indeed that the panel. Uh, there is a range of views in the survivor community uh, in terms of the type of individuals um, or, or indeed whether it should be a co-chair uh, or a panel. And we will continue um, in earnest uh, with that work. I think the point he asks about which uh, institutions, um, again, we have to look at the detail of that uh, because again, I'm acutely conscious when you look at the history um, of institutional child abuse in Scotland, it is not just uh, those institutions uh, of the state and there are children uh, of the 50s and 60s and perhaps even as late as the 70s who were put into institutional types of care um, but by a quite a, an informal uh, arrangement. So it is important that the terms of reference uh, are uh, crafted in a way that we will indeed uh, get the true nature and scope and the extent of institutional uh, child abuse in this country from children that were put into institutional care. Although I am very conscious uh, that there are many forms of uh, institutional care and we are committed to ensuring that survivors have the necessary uh, both emotional and financial support, uh, both to participate in the inquiry process, uh, but also as they go forward in their road to recovery. Lynette Milne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I too thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement. We too welcome this announcement by the Scottish Government that there will be a national inquiry into historic abuse of children in institutional care. I hope it will provide an opportunity to expose the perpetrators of such hideous crimes against children in Scotland and to learn lessons to prevent this abuse of children in care ever happening again. The Cabinet Secretary has explained that key stakeholders will be consulted to ensure the legal proceedings will be as accessible to survivors as possible. 
and today I want to emphasise the importance of ensuring the accessibility of this inquiry. She noted also that many survivors remain silent about abuse and have no voice. I'm concerned that this may remain the case unless there's very practical help uh, and support available for the brave people who come forward, because only an inquiry which supports survivors can truly deliver the justice that victims deserve. Can I ask how this inquiry will work alongside other inquiries into abuse, which will also take place across the United Kingdom? Will it share information with the other inquiries? And can the victims have confidence that guilty individuals who may have worked in institutions right across the United Kingdom will be held to account? Cabinet Secretary. I thank uh, Nanette Milne for her question. Also, it is important to recognise that the inquiry doesn't operate in isolation and it is the job of the police to investigate <laughs> Uh, the criminality of individuals and organisations. It's the job of prosecutors to prosecute and it's the job of courts uh, to convict on the basis of evidence. And all of that must continue and it does continue uh, on a, a daily basis. And I'm sure um, you know, my colleague Michael Matheson, the, the Justice Secretary, would give testimony uh, to that. But the point she makes about working with other um, inquiries where appropriate is a pragmatic one and we have to recognise that child abuse does not have any borders and that we may indeed have to work uh, with other jurisdictions but it is appropriate that we have in Scotland um, our national public statutory inquiry uh, looking at our failings as a country uh, in our past. Um, my officials have already uh, been in touch, for example, uh, with officials in Northern Ireland because there's an inquiry um, ongoing uh, on that basis. Uh, and of course, we will have um, you know, discussions and share information and experiences as appropriate um, with our colleagues in the UK government. But the point that Nanette Milne makes about the accessibility of the inquiry and again ensuring the right support uh, for survivors to participate is of course well made. But that is why crucially we are taking our time to work with survivors, get the right terms of reference, uh, get the right scope and the right people involved to lead this inquiry. And it is appropriate that we take the time uh, to do that and we do not rush uh, into decisions, albeit there is um, a deadline um, of, of April. So we have given ourselves, uh, rightly so, uh, some further time to work through the detail, but that's to work through the detail uh, with survivors. And I think that's entirely appropriate. Gil Patterson, followed by Alice McInnes. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I appreciate that the terms of the inquiry will be at a very early stage and that survivors must be consulted on this going forward. However, I wondered if the Cabinet Secretary could outline any specific actions of the inquiry that she hopes to achieve. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, um, having laid so much emphasis on the need to consult with survivors um, meaningfully and appropriately, I don't want to over-speculate um, about the purpose um, or indeed the terms of reference um, of um, an inquiry. But I think it is important to emphasise that the purpose of an inquiry is about getting to truth and justice. It is about giving that public acknowledgement and validation. It is about establishing uh, a comprehensive uh, national record. And it is crucially about understanding the nature and extent uh, of the abuse of children in care and the extent to which the state and non-state institutions failed in their duty to protect vulnerable children. And crucially, again, to consider how those feelings have been addressed in terms of policy practice uh, and legislation. And I'm very clear that the uh, inquiry has to be independent, it has to be robust. Um, and based on what survivors are telling me, they're looking for an inquisitorial inquiry as opposed to uh, an adversarial uh, inquiry. Uh, but it does need to focus on the systemic and institutional feelings that let so many of our children down. Alice McInnes, followed by Graham Pearson. Thank you, President Officer. I too welcome the announcement of a public inquiry with statutory powers. <laughs> Victims and survivors have long cried out for that. The trauma of victims and survivors must always, however, be to the forefront. How will the inquiry ensure that in getting to the truth, it doesn't compound that damage? And can I press the Cabinet Secretary on what support will be available to victims and survivors of abuse when they interact with the inquiry? 
And will third party advocates be able to present evidence on behalf of those unable to engage in them by themselves? Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I get back to Ms McInnes about the ins and outs of whether third parties can uh, represent in individuals? I will take that on board, but I think it needs to be uh, considered carefully. She makes a very important point that what we have to avoid is survivors being re-traumatised uh, by having to uh, give um, evidence and, or participate in an inquiry. It's important to stress uh, that the purpose of a statutory inquiry is not to compel victims or survivors. It's about compelling um, other witnesses uh, who are absolutely crucial uh, to get into the truth and the systemic and institutional uh, feelings. But we do have to ensure the right environment with the right skills and the right expertise leading uh, that inquiry, but also that is available to support um, you know, survivors. We must not, and this is coming very clearly from survivors themselves, we must not have a public inquiry that its processes and ways of doing business uh, will compound trauma or indeed re-traumatise individuals. We have to avoid that, and I'm very, very clear about that. Graham Pearson, followed by Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of her statement, and I think the uh, presentation of that statement today indicates that the Government gets it as far as uh, this issue is concerned. Uh, she should know that survivors have feared that over the years of delay, that has enabled the d destruction of paperwork, evidence, and perhaps the identity of some witnesses that might have been of some value to a public inquiry. Will she be able to assure survivors today that she'll take all steps from here on in to ensure that paperwork is protected and that evidence is maintained awaiting the creation of this inquiry? And will she ensure that instances of documentation that is either missing or been destroyed will be reported for the public information and in the interest of transparency. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I start by assuring Mr Pearson that I do indeed get it and this government gets it. And the point that he makes about records is crucially important um, because as a former social worker and indeed as a constituency MSP, um, I've certainly had individuals in my life who live with the, the frustration and the pain of not being able to understand or put together a chronology of their own life story because records are, are missing. And there is so much that we as individuals take for granted. We will all have many pictures of our own children and many documents and memorabilia um, of our own childhood and that of our children. And many of the survivors have huge gaps in their life because records were destroyed. And it is very difficult as part of their recovery to move forward when there are big gaps uh, in their life story. So the point about here on in about records is crucial and protecting the integrity uh, of information because I'm clear that survivors must have absolute confidence in the process. An important point, however, in terms of one of the core purposes uh, of an inquiry is to create that comprehensive uh, national record um, and that, I hope, may help some individuals be able to piece together um, you know, their own life story and their own life journey. But that comprehensive national record is very important to have that chronology uh, of events. And there's work that is currently ongoing as a government about having a, a, an online uh, database of all children's homes um, in Scotland, for, for example, and that's important work. And we are looking and learning from other jurisdictions in terms of Australia from their Find and Learn um, service as well. And some of that's about uh, helping people piece together their lives, but also um, to help people you know, relocate um, relatives and siblings and parents that they were separated from. Linda Fabiani, followed by Michael Russell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I would like to focus the Cabinet Secretary particularly on the issue of time bar, because you know, in, in her statement um, it mentions that uh, this will include, I quote, this will include consideration of the way in which time bar operates. And having been here for some time, I, I was able to look back and see that there was a review on the law of limitation back in 2004-05, and then again 
um, the Scottish Law Commission was asked to consider aspects of the law in such relation back in at the beginning of 2007. And, and it seems to me that there is a, a reluctance, perhaps, by the legal profession to look at time bar. And what I would say is that there is uh, now a recognition way ahead of anything we've ever had before because of recent very sad events right across the UK that um, survivors are very, very reluctant often to come forward for years and years and years. Can I impress upon the Cabinet Secretary that although she cannot interfere with the operation of the justice system, to take every step with herself and her colleagues to make sure that our justice system recognises the very particular characteristics that are inherent in these kind of cases? Cabinet Secretary. I appreciate Ms uh, Fabiani's um, actually long-standing interest uh, in the, the time bar matter. The time bar for civil cases, and it's important to stress that there's no time bar on criminal cases. I'm sure Ms Fabiani and others um, you know, recognise and understand that. But it is important as a government that we acknowledge and recognise that the time bar in civil cases is um, an issue of high priority uh, to survivors. Um, I'm pleased to say that Paul Wheelhouse, uh, the mm. Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, was, along with myself and Aileen Campbell, the Children's Minister, at the interaction event um, organised by the Scottish Human Rights Commission um, this Monday, uh, there himself to be listening to the, the views and concerns um, of survivors. Uh, she's right to say that the Scottish Law Commission uh, did look at this. It is complex. Uh, there is some flexibility um, for uh, judges in terms of the time bar, but nonetheless it remains um, of a great concern uh, to survivors. Uh, and Paul Wheelhouse, um, as I said in my statement, has written to key stakeholders uh, in the legal sector um, asking them to discuss these matters with him. And as a government, we will continue to work with survivors as Mr Wheelhouse's discussion uh, with the legal establishment continue, so that as a government we indeed have the fullest understanding uh, of the civil justice barriers uh, that are faced by survivors. Michael Russell, followed by Margaret McDougall. Uh, Presiding officer, can I very warmly welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement of an inquiry, and I'm sure it will be very warmly welcomed by the survivors of historic sexual abuse, um, who, in order to live and flourish, to move on from being survivors, need to have a clear narrative published and placed in the public record that makes it clear who was accountable and who remains accountable. Uh, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary therefore agrees with me that telling their stories so that we all understand the unimaginable horrors that they've gone through and that we can all resolve never to have that lived again by any child is, cr is a crucial part of this task. And that therefore, in putting it together, we need not just lawyers and social workers, we need archivists, we need historians, we need those from many disciplines. Uh, will she therefore ensure that the terms of reference contain those actions which can allow us not only to understand what has taken place, but to make sure it never, ever happens again. So, you know, so I'm very pleased that Michael Russell is in the chamber today. I know uh, that he's been a strong champion uh, of the support uh, that survivors much need, and he's also been a very strong advocate uh, for an inquiry. And the point that he makes about that personal testimony of survivors is a powerful one because the testimony, that personal testimony of survivors is very salient uh, to what we need to learn uh, as individuals and as, as a nation. And I spoke earlier in the response to Mr Pearson about how the importance uh, of that uh, national um, collective um, account of what's happened and who's responsible, how that is helpful uh, to individuals piecing together their own life and their own personal history. But as Michael Russell says, uh, that national picture and account of what's happened is actually imperative for us all to move forward collectively uh, as a nation to ensure that we do indeed learn the lessons uh, of the past and that's a very important purpose uh, of an inquiry to fully understand what has happened and why and compare it to what happens today because there is never any room for complacency when it comes to protecting our children. <clears throat> protecting our children has to be uh, our number one uh, priority in all matters. And it is therefore important that as we uh, progress in our consultation with survivors that we craft the terms of reference 
in the right way and that as we move forward in our consultation with survivors that we give appropriate consideration to the skills of all those involved either directly in the inquiry or as the work of the inquiry it moves forward. And he makes the point that that isn't just about legal experts or human rights experts or people from you know, care, support, health, education and social work. I think there is a need to look at the broader range of skills from a broader range of individuals to ensure that we do indeed have that accurate and very live account, that national account of what's happened and what's went wrong in the lives of so many of the nation children. Thank you. Before I call Margaret McDougall, can I say that, as I indicated at the outset, I intend to allow the statement um, and members to ask questions. I have another seven members who wish to ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary. I intend to take all of them. That will have an impact on the debate that comes afterwards. Uh, so those who, who may be speaking in the debate afterwards be prepared to cut your speeches. Uh, Margaret McDougall, followed by George Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I heard what the Cabinet Secretary said in response to Graham Pearson's question, and that from here on in, records will be protected. In some cases, survivors have been told there is no evidence to support their claims because records have been destroyed. And in some cases, those responsible for the abuse have died or their whereabouts are not known. What hope can you give survivors that these cases will be included as part of the inquiry? Cabinet Secretary. I appreciate that there is great difficulties in terms of the history of uh, missing records. And I do give uh, Graham Pearson and Margaret McDougall an undertaking to um, ensure that everything is being done and we'll go out and engage with appropriate stakeholders, whether it's health services, uh, social work services, uh, to look um, to ensure that we do everything we can to retrieve records where they still exist and to ensure that we have uh, best practice in terms of moving forward. And obviously there are legal requirements these days uh, in terms of the, the maintenance uh, and protection of information uh, contained um, in, 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 in records. But the whole purpose of an inquiry is to work with survivors, to enable survivors uh, to, to move forward, uh, to get to the truth, to, to get to justice, uh, to give survivors that much needed very public um, acknowledgement uh, and, and validation of what they've experienced. And of course, as I've said earlier, to create that very comprehensive uh, national record. George Adam, followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if she will bring forward legislative changes to extend the extraterritorial effects of sexual offences against children to include offences committed elsewhere in the UK so that they can be prosecuted in Scotland if needed? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, this is a very important matter that has been taken forward um, by my, my colleagues in, in justice. It is important to remember that the situation around extraterritoriality does not mean that sexual offences against children cannot be prosecuted. Uh, that said, it is correct that such cases can only be prosecuted in the part of the UK where the offence was committed. For example, if an offence uh, is committed in England, it can only be prosecuted in England and such offences cannot be by law be prosecuted uh, in Scotland. And the Scottish Government Ministerial uh, Working Group on Child Sexual Exploitation, which reported earlier this year, considered very much that there is a case for extending the extraterritorial effect of sexual offences against children to include uh, offences committed elsewhere in the United Kingdom so that they can be prosecuted in Scotland if that's the best place to conduct uh, the prosecution. And the Scottish Government agrees with the recommendation of that working group and we intend to introduce legislative change when there is a suitable legislative uh, opportunity. Jackie Bailey, followed by Graham Day. Can I welcome the statutory public inquiry into historical abuse and also welcome the Cabinet Secretary's clear commitment to the issue. I have constituents who have been affected and one of the issues raised consistently is indeed the time bar. And I know she will agree with the Human Rights Commission's view when they said that the time bar is a real barrier to survivors getting access to civil justice. It lacks flexibility. Survivors are indeed denied justice. Can I ask her quite simply, will the public inquiry be able to comment on the issue of time bar? Cabinet Secretary. As intimated uh, in, in my statement, we need to uh, do some further work 
with survivors on a range of issues in relation to the terms of reference uh, for uh, the public inquiry. And I really don't want to speculate uh, too much in advance um, of that consultation, um, but it's certainly not lost in me uh, that the time bar in civil cases is a huge issue for survivors, and it is indeed one as intimated my answers to, to Ms Fabiani, one that has been pursued uh, by Mr Wheelhouse and Mr Matheson. Graham Day, followed by Mark Griffin. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In terms of tackling child sexual exploitation, can the Cabinet Secretary outline how she anticipates the new Police Scotland National Child Abuse Investigation Unit will improve the coordination and intelligence gathering around CSE? Secretary. Officer, of course, this is um, an issue that uh, Mr Matheson and Mr Wheelhouse um, will be well versed in and will, of course, uh, be keeping a, a close eye on. I suppose from uh, my perspective, I think it's very uh, valuable that the new Police Scotland National Child Abuse Investigation Unit um, does provide a sort of national resource um, with that uh, range of very specialist skills and expertise and, of course, where necessary, it will lead and coordinate uh, complex inquiries, um, develop you know, better and good practice. And I think, crucially, it will also improve links between the police and third sector and other statutory agencies that will improve the intelligent networks uh, that are required to proactively uh, identify cases uh, of, of child abuse. It is important to note that this is a national resource and its job will be to directly support the, the good work undertaken by uh, the existing structure of local police child protection units um, across Scotland. Mark Griffin, followed by Alex Ferguson. Good officer. I know that the terms of reference of the inquiry are of utmost importance and that will take proper consideration. And can the Cabinet Secretary outline some of the work involved in the process of drafting those and tell survivors why it will take until the end of April before they know what the term, terms of reference are, although I do take on board the point that the Cabinet Secretary makes about sense over haste. Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. I think in, in terms of as we move forward over the next few months, it's important that we um, consult in a way that actually enables survivors to participate. Um, so we have written to various organisations that are currently uh, funded through uh, Survivor uh, Scotland uh, financial support. So there will be a number of small events uh, across the country to engage uh, survivors. Uh, there will also be some uh, larger regional events that will involve you know, health services in the third sector and uh, children's uh, charities uh, as well. The, the scope and remit of the terms of reference are absolutely crucial and how those are crafted is really important in terms of ensuring that survivors have confidence uh, in the inquiry, but also in terms of focus of purpose and having an inquiry that is going to achieve outcomes uh, that are meaningful to survivors and are also meaningful uh, to us uh, as uh, a country. Um, and it is important that, while I don't want to speculate too much uh, about the terms of reference, we do need to be having a discussion that survivors are seeking further discussion themselves on the terms of reference, particularly around what is classed or considered to be uh, institutional uh, care. Uh, and it's also uh, imperative um, that we don't make mistakes that have happened in other jurisdictions, because I'm clear, if you're taking the step, as we're all agreed, we should be taking this next step to having a national public inquiry, we must get it right, and we therefore must work with others, we can't act in isolation, and we must get all the detail uh, absolutely correct. Alex Ferguson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank you for giving extra time to this important um, statement. Um, I have to say I agree with the many who have said it's taken us too long to get here. I think you could argue with justification it's taken us 14 years too long to get here, but having got here, I'm delighted uh, at where we are. While in opposition, senior members of the Cabinet Secretary's party argued vehemently that they would end the time bar uh, within the civil justice system if and when they came to power. Now, I've listened to the responses given to Linda Fabiani and Jackie Bailey very carefully, but can I ask her genuinely, what is to stop her ensuring that the inquiry itself not just discusses, but actually suspends or looks at the suspension of the time bar for civil cases of historic abuse? 
think I can only say simply and succinctly to Mr Ferguson that I can't change the past, but I hope I can work with everybody in this chamber to, to change the future. Uh, the time bar undoubtedly is very important to survivors, and survivors are indeed being ably represented by MSPs uh, on this matter on a cross-party uh, basis, and that is to be welcome. We will you know, seriously take on board the views of all members and those of, of survivors. And I'm pleased that Mr Wheelhouse uh, is sitting here right next to me because he will be the lead in taking this work forward. And finally, Michael McMahon. Thank you, President Officer. Um, as the convener of the Petitions Committee that brought forward the petition 10 years ago that led to the then First Minister Jack McConnell issuing his apology on behalf of the people of Scotland, I have uh, retained a, a keen interest uh, in this issue, but I also recall some of the issues that were raised at the time uh, when the petition was being brought forward, especially um, concerns raised by the Catholic Church uh, about uh, obstacles that they foresaw in any potential inquiry. And the Cabinet Secretary is absolutely right when she said that child abuse has no borders, but the Catholic Church at that time argued that the responsibility uh, for institutions within the Catholic Church did have different borders because the hierarchy of the, the Catholic Church means that the bishops in Scotland have no responsibility for those orders, that the responsibility lies with the Holy See in Rome. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us what discussions have taken place with the Catholic Church which has overcome those potential obstacles and why they now uh, are more uh, comfortable with an inquiry taking place because it's vitally important that, that obstacle is removed? Cabinet Secretary. Can I say to Mr McMahon that uh, my officials have been in touch with a range of religious organisations and children's charities. We have many religious organisations and children's charities uh, in this country uh, that have a past like the nation, uh, that we have a past that has let our children down and that collectively, whether it's we as the state, the government, uh, religious organisations and charities, we have to look that past square in the eye uh, acknowledge our failings, acknowledge the damage that's done and move forward together. And I think one of the strengths of a public inquiry is that it gives a good opportunity to religious organisations and charities to demonstrate that they are open to participate uh, fully uh, and voluntarily uh, in an inquiry and that they indeed, like the rest of us, acknowledge the failings of the past and are utterly committed uh, to making things right for children today and the children for tomorrow. Thank you. That ends the statement by the Cabinet Secretary on historic child abuse. We move to the next item of business. And